We're going to wait and see. We're also covering a new case, the Philip Holland case in Wisconsin. This is a hatchet attack case of all things, where apparently a couple of friends were involved in some drugs that led to an argument and that led to allegedly a hatchet attack and now a murder trial. Let's go in for some details on the Philip Holland case. The trial of a Wisconsin man accused of savagely killing another man with a hatchet is set to begin this week. 59-year-old Philip Holland is accused of fatally striking 45-year-old Timothy Minkley several times in the head with a hatchet following an argument. Minkley reportedly berated Holland for not properly setting an alarm to wake them up after a night of smoking marijuana together in September 2015 before Holland snapped. Holland told authorities he went into kill mode and his male ego prevented him from walking away from the confrontation after he admitted to lying about Minkley being armed with a pocket knife. He is charged with first degree intentional homicide, misdemeanor thefts and possession of a legally obtained prescription. Holland faces a mandatory life sentence if convicted of the top charge. I'm Anthony Velez for Law and Crime. So we're expecting live testimony to pick up after jury selection in the Philip Holland case a little bit later on. In the meantime, let's introduce our guest. Jonah Spilbor is a criminal defense attorney here in New York City. Jonah, good to see you again. Good to see you as always. We've got these two cases going on, the hatchet attack case, the Jeffrey Willis case. The Willis case is the huge mystery here. Mm -hmm. Not a lot of direct evidence linking this defendant to this specific crime, right. but keep in mind he's already been convicted of another murder. That was the murder of a jogger named Rebecca Bletch. Mm -hmm. And we've got a lot of the same evidence in this case as the other case, but the link is, is much more tenuous. The interesting thing about this case is that sometimes if you close your eyes, you're going to forget that we're actually in the murder case of someone whose body has never been found because the judge is allowing a plethora of past criminal activity into evidence in this case in an effort to connect the dots, as you, you just mentioned a couple minutes ago in the open. There is no direct evidence, Aaron, connecting this defendant, who is very unlikable, to the murder, the presumed murder, of Jessica Haringa. Yes, look, we've got a lot of indirect evidence here. We've mm -hmm. got these computer files, and we're going to get into oh. some of that testimony in a little bit here. You've got sex toys, you've got these computer files with all these victims' names in it. We're going to break that all down for you folks who are listening and watching today. We also want to get everybody caught up on some top news stories that have been happening that we're following here at lawandcrime.com. We'll be back with more on these trials in just a second. You never know exactly what's going to happen in live court. You know, Jonah, we always get these warnings from the judge that this is a court of law and no outbursts will be tolerated. We hear them time and time again, but yep. you never know what will happen. And that's why the court officer is your best friend sometimes in a courtroom, especially when you're dealing with a criminal case with perhaps some violent defendants, as was the case here. Exactly. Okay, let's switch gears and talk about the Jeffrey Willis case in Michigan. This is a case involving the murder of that young mother, 25-year-old Jessica Herringa. She was a young mother, mother of one, disappeared April 26, 2013 from a gas station where she was working. We heard from some of the folks who were customers. They walked in and the gas station was wide open and no one was to be seen. So at some point, the theory is that she was taken right in the middle of her shift at work right. at this gas station, and that adds to the mystery. Her body has never been found. Her mother refuses to believe that she's gone and continues the search online, especially, and elsewhere in the community to try to find her daughter. Part of the mystery here is that a cousin of this defendant, Jeffrey Willis's cousin, mm -hmm. said that he helped hide the body he didn't testify to this at trial. He told police this, and then he clammed up. Right. But they went and searched everywhere where he said she could be. No signs that anything ever happened in those locations. Mm -hmm. So where is she? How unusual is it for a court to accept a plea of guilty to a crime that it cannot prove? So it's amazing that the cousin here says, I know where we hid the body. I helped hide the body. I'll come show you where the body is. The body isn't there, but yet they accepted a guilty plea for hiding the body from the cousin. Another conundrum in this case, because as I mentioned, the defendant here is not a likable guy. He has information on his computer that is, in a word, 
disgusting. Oh, yes. He is convicted already of another murder. He kidnapped, uh, thankfully, almost thankfully, he kidnapped somebody who is the link between the crime that he's on trial for now and others. And for whatever reason, he just, he's participating in his own defense here and he's an unlikable dude. He is unlikable. Look, he's going around to middle schools, high schools, sporting events, videotaping girls and women, even recording coworkers. And he's got these files on his computer, including the names of the victim for whom he was already convicted of killing. And there was a DNA link in that case. Mm -hmm. But also within those files is the name Jessica Herringa. Yep. So that's how the authorities, the prosecutor here, is trying to make the link saying, okay, well, he killed one person and her name is in this computer in the file system. And then this next victim, her name is also right there next to the previous victim. And let's you know, let's connect the dots that way. Then they get the cousin to supposedly spill the beans, but his version of the story doesn't make a lot of sense, as right. we've discussed. And look, the link that draws it all together is this other teenager he tried to abduct yes. right off the side of the road yes. at gunpoint. She got away, ran terrified into the house that she just happened to be passing, a stranger's house. Yes. And that stranger called police. They were able to track down the van based on her description mm -hmm. and videos of vans passing other surveillance points in the area, places that had security cameras. Yeah. And they, they were able to get uh, motor vehicle experts to say, okay, that's a, a certain make, a certain model based on the image of the van, linked it in the motor vehicle registry to this guy. And that was what connected the dots with the unsolved Rebecca Bletch murder. Right. And it finally got us into the Jessica Herringa case that we're in right now but it's a much more tenuous link this time around. Yes. We're going to listen to some testimony now. Charlene, Charlene rather, Charlene Bishop, Jeffrey Willis's ex-wife was on the stand. She changed her name back because she doesn't want anything to do with this guy. She testified in the Rebecca Bletch case. She testified in the Jessica Herringa case. She had some really critical testimony, folks, so let's start at the top. The former wife of convicted killer Jeffrey Willis on the witness stand in another murder case that that same defendant is facing. This one over the death of 25-year-old Jessica Herring, a gas station attendant who disappeared one night in the middle of her shift. On the screen there, for those of you listening on Sirius XM radio, images of the defendant's gun, both in a laboratory and in his dresser drawer. We heard his former wife talk about swim meets. Questions as to why he would have gone there. He did have daughters, but look, we're going to hear a lot more about why he was going to those swim mates. Probably because he was videotaping girls and women. We'll get into a lot more about that in just a moment. Also, you heard testimony there about insulin needles. Her episodes as a diabetic. She had an insulin pump, which means she really didn't need the syringes. But police found syringes in his van and in his house. Why did he have them? Was it possibly to try to put his victims in a coma? Those are the dots that authorities are trying to connect here, and that's why you heard some of that questioning. We're going to be back with more testimony in the Jeffrey Willis murder case out of Michigan in just a moment. All right, we're back with more discussion of the Jeffrey Willis murder case in Michigan, the case of a missing young woman, 25-year-old Jessica Herringa, whose body has never been found and whose mother refuses to believe that she's dead. I'm here with Jonas Spielborg, criminal defense attorney from New York. We're in this testimony from this guy's ex-wife, and look, he's trolling swimming pools and sporting events and parking lots for videos of women. He's got all these rape videos on his computer. This is a sick guy, yeah. okay? Finally accused of trying to basically abduct a teenager by the side of the road. She gets away, runs to a stranger's house, begs for help. That's how they catch up with this guy. But here, in this particular case, we've got to look at the evidence against the defendant in this case, the Jessica Herringa case, and they don't have a lot. This is a hard case for the state to win. Isn't that so interesting? They don't have a lot of evidence in this case to prove that, A, there was a murder and that it was of Jessica Herringa. 
but they have a whole lot of evidence in other cases against him that the judge is allowing in, which is very, very unusual. If you had to characterize this case in a word, you would say it's all about the defendant's character, mm -hmm. which is why we are now hearing from his ex-wife, which is why the judge is allowing in prior bad act evidence, all to prove a crime has occurred because we don't have a body. And how, I, you know, I don't know whether it's good or bad that Jessica's mother, the victim's mother, doesn't want to believe that she's dead. She's not going to be a very helpful witness for the state if she doesn't believe her own daughter has met her demise. That's if they call her. Now, look, I think that if they didn't have this computer of the defendants with these dozens upon dozens upon dozens of files, one of which was a file about this victim, uh -huh. Jessica Herringa, 25 years old. If that file wasn't on that computer, I think it would be very hard for them to bring in all this character evidence, all this other bad acts evidence, because they wouldn't have a, a, ski, a common scheme or plan right. of what the law would require for this to all come in. It would be a lot harder to prosecute this case. It would be a lot harder. And you have to look back. It's almost as if the big break in this case happened because of the kidnapping of a teenage girl. We don't wish a kidnapping on anybody, but if it were not for that incident, a lot of, not a lot, a few of the dots that have been since been connected would not have been. It's almost as if the kidnapping victim is the break the police needed in this particular murder case. We are listening to court cases unfold here on the Law & Crime Network and also on Law & Crime on Sirius XM Radio. So let's get right back to the testimony of Charlene Bishop, the ex-wife of the defendant who is accused of a second murder. She's getting into more details about what she was doing when the police were questioning her husband. Let's listen. This is testimony from the defendant's ex-wife. Her name, Charlene Bishop. We're listening to the Jeffrey Willis murder case out of Michigan. He's accused of killing a young mother named Jessica Herring at 25 years old when she disappeared from her job at a gas station. Her disappearance was April 26, 2013. Her body has never been found. Jonah Spielborg is a criminal defense attorney here in New York. Jonah, let's run through this defendant's version of what he was up to when this young mother disappeared. He said he went to the gas station at about 5 o'clock, talked to the victim, Jessica Herringer, for about three minutes, he said. This is what he told police. He said he went to play this card game from 5 o'clock till about 9.30, and we heard testimony earlier in the case from his uh, card-playing partner. Okay, he says he went home after the card game at about 9.30, was home between 9.30 and 12.30 in the morning. And then he says he went over to his deceased grandfather's house at about 12.30 in the morning to get wood to make repairs to some kind of a dog cage or kennel or dog house or something, but it wasn't made of wood. <laughs> so police are trying to figure that out. So anyway, he says he goes to his grandfather's house, then he goes to Taco Bell, and then he goes home. That's his version of this. Mm -hmm. Now, the cousin's story, which of course doesn't check out fully, in which it's doubtful that it's even going to come into this case, okay, because he pled the fifth in the last one. Right. The cousin's version of it is, is that this defendant had the victim's body in the basement at the grandfather's house. Mm -hmm. So, look, what's going on here? <laughs> Something's not matching up if the state's theory of this case is correct. Well, a lot of things aren't matching up. First of all, I think it's incredulous that his, his alibi is basically, ah, I was doing this, I was doing that, I hung out, and then... It, Right, right around midnight, I decided I need to go to my dead grandfather's house to get wood to fix a metal crate. Like, that just is implausible. That doesn't make a whole yeah, lot of sense. Yeah, I mean, why sense. at 1230 in the morning as well? I mean, can't it wait yeah. until the next day? I mean, is there a dog running loose or something here? That's just, that's very thin alibi evidence. And you and I were talking, actually, during the break. I'm surprised that there isn't more actual video evidence chronicling his movement or somebody's movement in that gas station at the time that the victim went missing. I'm very surprised by that. Exactly. I mean, many of these cases, we've got cameras all over the place at all gas over. stations. So I'm, I'm curious about that as well. And we have not yet seen that in this case. We're going to continue on listening to our testimony from Charlene Bishop. This is the defendant, Jeffrey Willis's ex-wife. She left him, wants nothing to do with him, changed her name back, doesn't even want the Willis name anymore after her husband was accused not only of the murder of Jessica Herringa, which is on trial right now, 
but in the murder of a young mother named Rebecca Bletch and the attempted abduction of a teenager who was walking by the side of the road. This defendant has been tied up in a series of crimes. He had all kinds of pornography and strange rape fantasy videos on his computer. That's some of the evidence that authorities are using in this case. Here, his wife starts to talk about that evidence. This is testimony from the defendant's ex-wife. Her name, Charlene Bishop. We're listening to the Jeffrey Willis murder case out of Michigan. He's accused of killing a young mother named Jessica Herring at 25 years old when she disappeared from her job at a gas station. Her disappearance was April 26, 2013. Her body has never been found. Jonah Spielborg is a criminal defense attorney here in New York. Jonah, let's run through this defendant's version of what he was up to when this young mother disappeared. He said he went to the gas station at about 5 o'clock talked to the victim, Jessica Herringer, for about three minutes, he said. This is what he told police. He said he went to play this card game from 5 o'clock till about 9.30, and we heard testimony earlier in the case from his uh, card-playing partner. Okay, he says he went home after the card game at about 9.30, was home between 9.30 and 12.30 in the morning. And then he says he went over to his deceased grandfather's house at about 12.30 in the morning to get wood to make repairs to some kind of a dog cage or kennel or dog house or something, but it wasn't made of wood. <laughs> so police are trying to figure that out. So anyway, he says he goes to his grandfather's house, then he goes to Taco Bell, and then he goes home. That's his version of this. Mm -hmm. Now, the cousin's story, which of course doesn't check out fully, in which it's doubtful that it's even going to come into this case, okay, because he pled the fifth in the last one. Right. The cousin's version of it is, is that this defendant had the victim's body in the basement at the grandfather's house. Mm -hmm. So, look, what's going on here? <laughs> Something's not matching up if the state's theory of this case is correct. Well, a lot of things aren't matching up. First of all, I think it's incredulous that his, his alibi is basically, ah, I was doing this, I was doing that, I hung out, and then right, right around midnight, I decided I need to go to my dead grandfather's house to get wood to fix a metal crate. Like, that just is implausible. That doesn't make a whole yeah, lot of sense. Yeah, I mean, why at 12.30 in the morning as well? I mean, can't it wait yeah. until the next day? I mean, is there a dog running loose or something here? That's just, that's very thin alibi evidence. And you and I were talking actually during the break. I'm surprised that there isn't more actual video evidence chronicling his movement or somebody's movement in that gas station at the time that the victim went missing. I'm very surprised by that. Exactly. I mean, many of these cases, we've got cameras all over the place at all gas over. stations. So I'm, I'm curious about that as well. And we have not yet seen that in this case. We're going to continue on listening to our testimony from Charlene Bishop. This is the defendant, Jeffrey Willis's ex-wife. She left him, wants nothing to do with him, changed her name back, doesn't even want the Willis name anymore after her husband was accused not only of the murder of Jessica Herringer, which is on trial right now, but in the murder of a young mother named Rebecca Bletch and the attempted abduction of a teenager who was walking by the side of the road. This defendant has been tied up in a series of crimes. He had all kinds of pornography and strange rape fantasy videos on his computer. That's some of the evidence that authorities are using in this case. Here, his wife starts to talk about that evidence. You're listening to testimony in a real court case unfold. This is the Jeffrey Willis case on law and crime and law and crime on Sirius XM radio. Jeffrey Willis is on trial for the alleged murder of Jessica Herring, a 25-year-old gas station attendant who disappeared in the middle of her shift. Her body has never been found, and her mother indeed refuses to believe that her daughter is dead. But bottom line, we've got a defendant sitting in court, this is the defendant's ex-wife testifying, and here we're listening to the ex-wife get into some of the items that were in the defendant's grandfather's house. Now, one theory of this case is that the defendant had brought this particular victim's body over to his deceased grandfather's house, and that that's where the body was held or stored before it was buried. Jonah Spielberg is a criminal defense attorney here in New York City. Jonah, that's one version of this, and that's why we're getting into the discussion about the cleaning fluid, the bleach. Did he use this as part of a cleanup, possibly? Well, 
That's the working theory, because apparently the grandfather in his later years, when he was fallen ill, wouldn't have needed any of those cleanup items in his basement. So what were they doing there? Again, another dot that the prosecution is trying to connect, that it was actually Willis who was using those items to clean up a crime scene. And here we have Willis's ex-wife testifying against him in this case. No attempt at spousal privilege or no, no. recognized privilege here for this kind of testimony. And we're getting into what seemed like very mundane details of life. You know, who was taking care of the father? What items would he have had in the house? Mm -hmm. We're going through these lengths to try to get at these cleaning products. And also, we have to remember, there's no direct evidence here. There's not one speck of this victim's DNA anywhere on anything that this defendant had. And this is going to be an interesting cross-examination because essentially, we've been talking a lot about the prosecution's case. The defense case isn't, hey, my guy didn't do it. The defense case really boils down to, hey, prosecutor, you can't prove it. And this type of testimony, I think the defense attorney might have a field day with for that very reason. Yes, we're going to continue listening in. More testimony here from the defendant's ex-wife. This is Charlene Bishop. We're going to hear a little bit more about these cleaning products. Again, this is critical, folks, because one of the theories of this case is that defendant Jeffrey Willis took the body of the victim, Jessica Herringa, to his grandfather's house, and that's where he stored the body for at least some period of time. Did he clean up? Let's listen to some of the wife's testimony. You're listening to a real court case unfold if you're listening to us on Law and Crime on Sirius XM Radio. This is the Jeffrey Willis case. It's a murder trial out of Michigan, and the defendant's ex-wife is on the witness stand here. So, look, there's a lot to unravel here. Discussion about the defendant, Jeffrey Willis, wanting to buy a van. Well, of course, the van allegedly was used not only in this murder, but in another murder for which this defendant was already convicted. That was the Rebecca Bletch murder. And that conviction came down at the end of last year. It also is the van alleged to have been used in the kidnapping attempt of a teenager who was just walking home by the side of the road. Jonah Spielborg is a criminal defense attorney here in New York City. She's along with me today. We've got to break down for people listening on the radio what was on the screen there, because one of the accusations is that he had all of these cleaning products in the basement at his grandfather's house. His grandfather had passed several years before these women disappeared. Right. So why were all these boxes and bottles of cleaning products in the basement at the grandfather's? The wife just testified that the grandfather wouldn't have needed them because she was taking care of things there. But look at what was in the picture here. Mm -hmm. Four big, huge bottles of bleach. Six big bulk boxes of Tide detergent and one big bottle of Tide detergent. That was what was up on the screen during that testimony. Mm -hmm. So for those of you listening on Sirius XM, put the picture together here. Why did he need those cleaning products in the basement at his grandfather's house? Keep in mind, one theory of the case is that he had hid the body in the basement at the grandfather's right. house as well. And that theory gets stronger. If you're sitting in the jury box and you saw the picture that was online about all of those cleaning products, that theory gets stronger. Couple that with his ex-wife is now testifying, look, I would have thrown those out. I was taking care of the grandfather. The only thing that he really needed was on his living level, and he used to eat a lot of cornflakes. In other words, Grandpa wasn't schlepping down to the basement to clean up with, you know, 18 gallons of bleach and Tide. He wouldn't have needed to do that. So somebody other than the ex-wife who's t testifying and the grandfather had to have put it there, needed it for a reason, and the theory of the case is it was Jeffrey Willis. Exactly. Okay. We also know from the police that the van was absolutely spotless when they finally mm -hmm. tracked it down. And look, we know not one speck of the victim's DNA on anything that this defendant had, but the DNA of one of the other victims was on a few things that he had. That's so. Right. This is sort of an interesting thing. If he was that thorough of a cleaner, why was he so thorough in cleaning up after one alleged crime, but not of another? You know, DNA is one of those things where sometimes you think you got it all clean and you don't, and sometimes, you know, you don't, but you do. And it, it's just, it's a piece of evidence that even the best criminal, even if you're a Jeffrey Willis, 
something could get past you. Well, we're going to continue listening to testimony in the Jeffrey Willis case in just a moment. We also want to bring you up to speed on another case we're following here at Law and Crime. That's the Eli Manning case. This is not a criminal case. He didn't do anything wrong. This is a civil case alleging fraud. Let's listen to some of the details of this case. We're back here on the Law and Crime Network, and thanks to those of you listening to Law and Crime on Sirius XM Radio. I'm here with Jonna Spielberg, who's a criminal defense attorney in New York City, and we're talking about the Jeffrey Willis murder case in Michigan, which is underway. Court is not in session today, so we're listening to some of the critical testimony that happened in the past week in this case. But look, Jeffrey Willis, this guy's a bad guy. He's accused of videotaping women in all sorts of inappropriate circumstances, you know, looking and peering into windows and taping people while they're undressing, and he's taping kids at athletic meets. You know, creep. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so, you know, look, but, but I have to look at this logically and say, did this guy commit the crime he is accused of committing, and did the prosecution prove it beyond a reasonable doubt? And this is an uphill battle mm -hmm. because they don't have direct evidence. Not only that, they don't have a body. Exactly. But the one thing the prosecution does have that you normally do not have when you're prosecuting a case is they are being allowed to present evidence of prior bad acts and prior crimes against this defendant because there is an exception to the rule. And that exception is they are proving that there was a prior scheme or plan because a lot of what Jeffrey Willis has done in the past that has been proven or that we know falls in line with the theory of this case. Like, it was, you know, wash, rinse, repeat for Jeffrey Willis. He had a particular way that he committed crimes, and the prosecution's theory is he did it again here. The critical testimony that might be the link that some jurors are looking for is the computer forensics. And a lot of times this testimony is dry, but here it's critical, and here it's shocking because of the number of rape, fantasy, films, pictures and whatnot that this defendant had on his personal computer. It was thousands of files that investigators had to go through. This stuff, again, makes this guy perhaps the most unwholesome person that we've seen in a courtroom in quite some time. But it's important because it's one of the few links that authorities have which tie this defendant to this victim. Let's listen to Gerald McCarthy. He's a computer forensic expert. We're listening to testimony from a computer forensics expert in the Jeffrey Willis murder trial out of West Michigan. This is a case where a defendant is accused in his second murder trial of killing a gas station attendant named Jessica Herringa. Now, Jonna Spielbohr is here with me. She's a criminal defense attorney here in New York City. Jonna, look, you got a computer expert up there who's looked at a lot of defendants' devices, mm -hmm. and he's saying this is the largest collection of murder rape, kidnapping, pornography that he had seen, and he's presumably been around the block a few times with this type of stuff. Exactly. And the inference there is, um, th who would have that type of material on their computer unless you were up to no good, especially that much of it? Exactly. We're going to listen to more of that computer forensic expert's testimony right now. You're listening to real testimony in a real murder trial. This is the Jeffrey Willis case out of West Michigan. A defendant who's accused of killing young mother Jessica Herringa. She disappeared in the middle of her shift at a gas station and was never seen again. Look, here on the screen, Jonah, we saw all sorts of disturbing items. We saw handcuffs. We saw, I was trying to make a list here, handcuffs. We saw his gun. We saw a rope. We saw this, like, gag ball that's some kind of a sex toy and we've got the computer expert on the stand saying basically look there were videos of these items being used in rape fantasies and, and all sorts of perverse stuff what what did he do go troll on the internet for these movies decided that he liked it and then he went and bought the items oh. is is that the dot the, the chain of, of dots that they're trying to connect here i interpret this as jeffrey willis were using was using these let's call them snuff videos for lack of a better word, as his playbook. Like he would research it online, determine how all these people could be tortured and killed, and then he went out and he bought the same items. It's like if I go shoe shopping and I see a pair of shoes, I like I go and I buy them, but this guy is sick 
And this is what he was doing online. That's what this expert's there to testify to. And this isn't the, the minimal part of it here. I mean, you've got the computer files with specific victims' names. He had this folder called VIX, V-I-C-S, short for victims. Right. And he had one with the initials of another woman, Rebecca Bledge, for whom he was already convicted of killing, exactly. and one for Jessica Herringa, the initials J-L-H. Okay, but we're going to hear in a bit that that folder may not have been created until after her death. Raises a lot of questions as to why. We're going to get into that when we come back. Thanks again for listening to the Law and Crime Network. We're also on Sirius XM Radio on Law and Crime. We'll be right back. We are listening to testimony in the Jeffrey Willis murder case out of Michigan, the case of a man who's accused of killing a 25-year-old mother named Jessica Herringa. She disappeared in the middle of her shift at a gas station. She was never seen or heard from again, and authorities have never found her body. We're going to listen to some more testimony in this case. Jonah, one of the critical points of this is the computer hard drive, and we're listening to some of the testimony of this forensics expert. Yeah. These computer experts are becoming star witnesses in their own right because oftentimes an individual's computer is a window into a defendant's own mind, and oh, yeah. here it's a window that not many people want to look into. Yes, and in no small way. This is probably, I'm going to say right now, it's the most critical evidence in this case because, again, the jurors have to listen to this. They know that there's no body. They know there's no direct evidence connecting Jeffrey Willis to the murder of Jessica Haringa. But when you have this plethora of um, computer evidence showing disgusting crimes, a folder with her initials on it next to a folder with someone else's initials on it who he was convicted of killing it's not a big leap for these jurors to say this guy is a bad actor yes okay and to make the link here we're listening to testimony about the jessica herring a case but this defendant was also accused of killing a, another mother who was jogging by the side of the road named rebecca bletch right. he had two folders on the computer one had Rebecca Bletch's initials, and one had Jessica Herringas. Now, the Rebecca Bletch case, which was already tried, was an easier case because her DNA was on some of his sex toys. Right. That was a clear link. You've got a folder with her initials on it, and her DNA is on his items, okay? Right. Why would her DNA be on his items? It's not like they had a relationship, they weren't friends. I think they may have known one another vaguely socially, but but look, that case w was a, a much stronger case for yeah. the state. So what they're trying to do here is say similar occurrence we just don't have the luck of having the DNA, but is it going to be enough? That's the question for jurors in this case. Let's listen to some more of this really critical testimony from the forensic expert, again, a crucial witness for the state in trying a circumstantial case like this. This is testimony from Gerald McCarthy, a computer forensics expert who's testifying in the Jeffrey Willis murder case in West Michigan. Jeffrey Willis is accused of, mur of, of murdering, yes, young mother Jessica Herringa, 25 years old. She disappeared in the midst of a shift at a gas station. We heard from her boyfriend, the father of her child. We heard from DNA experts and now a forensic expert. And the forensic expert seems to have the most critical evidence in this case. Jonna Spilbor is a criminal defense attorney here in New York City. She's been analyzing the case along with us. Look, we just heard the testimony about these folders. We, we're starting to think, hey, wait a minute, why does he have this, this folder in the midst of all this pornography on his computer with rape fantasies and murder fantasies and all of these twisted sexual fantasies? And then he's got these folders with the victim's initials. Yeah. That, that connects the dots here for the jury, it seems. You know, I don't know about you, but I don't have any folders in my computer labeled murder. Although you and I being in this business, we might have a need for that if we're doing research. Well, you know, I've got a, I've got a lot of pictures of victims here, but it's because we need to put them on the screen when right. we're discussing the segments. I'm a journalist. I'm not, right. you know, a perpetrator and, here. So. And he was not. But he just really, Jeffrey Willis left a trail on his computer of things necrophilia, pornography, murder, different types of equipment used to commit these heinous crimes, and he had a, a folder with the initials of this particular victim on it. I do not think it's going to hurt the prosecution, however, we just heard this forensic expert say the folder seemed to have been created 
three years, actually on the third anniversary of the disappearance, or in this case murder, of Jessica Haringa. I don't see that that hurts the prosecution because people often go back to the scene of the crime. This could have been Jeffrey Willis's way of memorializing what he did three years earlier. Yeah, I mean, the dates are going to be really critical here, and we're going to, going to get into testimony about that in just a bit. But, you know, look, it's one thing to have images if you're part of a search party, if you're a journalist, yes. if you're trying to find someone who is missing, which is the way this case started, obviously. Mm -hmm. But, and look, the defense did make a point about this being a folder that was added after she was in the news, but and they're just trying to say, well, it, it's, you know, it's after the the fact. It's not like he was using this to, you know, stalk her online or something like that. But why was it saved on the exact anniversary? That's the bizarre part. Yes, exactly. And therefore, like I said, I don't think that the defense is going to make much hay in the eyes of the jury with the fact that the timing of the creation of this folder was after the fact and not before. One of the other points of evidence in this case is that the defendant's van was shockingly clean, according to investigators who searched it, once they eventually did catch up with this particular defendant. But let's get back to testimony from that computer forensic expert. We've been talking about the Jeffrey Willis murder case out of Michigan. He's accused of killing Jessica Herringa, a 25-year-old mother who disappeared in the middle of a work shift. Look, this computer forensic expert is the critical testimony Let's get into the nitty-gritty about the dates on these folders on the defendant's computer. A lot of moving parts in the testimony there of the computer forensic expert who is on the witness stand in the Jeffrey Willis murder case out of Michigan. Jonna Spielborg is a criminal defense attorney here in New York City. She's listening to this testimony along with me. Jonna, look, you've got some discussion about these folders that this guy had in his computer. Mm -hmm. You've got an Excel spreadsheet where he was tracking his budget. And right. in that spreadsheet are a number of entries for repeat visits to the gas station where victim Jessica Herringa worked. And of course, we know that he's accused of taking her from that gas station. So this is evidence from his own computer that he was there several times. Mm -hmm. And he admitted to police in his interview at the time of his arrest or around that time that he was there and that he would talk to her. So right. is this evidence of a pattern or is this just the neighborhood gas station where everyone's visiting? Yeah. I'm going with this is definitely pattern evidence. He knew because of his prior dealings at that gas station when she would be there if he talked to her before. This is really what, what's being described here is a method of stalking her which ultimately he realized when the night that she went missing in the middle of the night with his lame excuse that he needed to go get wood from his dead grandfather's house after midnight makes no sense, not plausible. He's a liar. Okay, that uh, wraps the whole start, case up in, in about 30 <laughs> seconds. Look, you know, we also had some, some more testimony there about these videos that he made, these, these quote, homemade videos were in a folder on his computer where he's right. trolling area parking lots, pools, athletic events, recording women, young teenage girls, some under 18, mm -hmm. we heard him say. You know, th what's this guy doing? Is he targeting specific people? Is he targeting everybody? I think specifically he's targeting women. We know that. This computer expert um, just testified that it's evident from the videos that the people that he was recording had, had no, no idea clue. they were being so it's not like oh we're at a picnic ooh the smile for the camera no he was doing it surreptitiously which is another creep factor with this defendant okay adding a lot of creep factor yes. onto this guy but not a lot of direct evidence really no clear direct evidence that he is guilty of this particular crime right is it going to be enough for the jury to convict Jeffrey Willis of the murder of Jessica Herring again folks you're listening to real court cases unfold on the Law and Crime Network and of course if you're listening on Sirius XM, we're helping walk you through the testimony. A great case, a big whodunit, more when we come back from the Jeffrey Willis trial in Michigan. We are dedicated to bringing you live coverage of trials and hearings across the country here on the Law and Crime Network and also on Law and Crime on Sirius XM Radio. There's another case besides the Jeffrey Willis murder case that we're following here, and that is the Philip Holland case out of Wisconsin. This is a case with an alleged hatchet attack. We are expecting opening statements in that case today. Let's get an update on the background in the Philip Holland case.
We are expecting opening statements in the Philip Holland case in Wisconsin sometime today. We will bring you live to that courtroom as soon as the jury is seated and as soon as those opening statements begin. In the meantime, back to the Jeffrey Willis murder case out of Michigan, the case of a man facing his second murder trial. This one has to do with the disappearance and presumed death of 25-year-old young mother Jessica Herringa. She disappeared from a gas station where she had been working and where the defendant admitted he was a repeat customer. He admitted to talking with her. No direct DNA evidence in this case, but a lot of creepy evidence, a lot of stories that just don't match up. Is it going to be enough for a conviction? We are going to have to wait and see. We are listening to testimony from computer forensic expert Gerald McCarthy. He is testifying about all these creepy videos, Jonas Spielborg, yeah. that he found on this defendant's computer. This is probably the strongest link that the state's going to get in this case. You know, I agree with that. This is, granted, circumstantial evidence, but a lot of people are behind bars based on circumstantial evidence. This really is giving the jury a picture of who this defendant is, because I guarantee you there are precious few of them in the jury that would have this type of evidence on their own computer. He's got evidence from a prior murder that he's been convicted of on that computer. He's got videos of necrophilia, pornography, torturous devices to hurt and maim and kill somebody with, and he has a folder with this victim's initials on it. And the key here, I think, is looking at at the links. OK, so you got two victims. Mm -hmm. One victim in his so-called victims folder right. is Rebecca Bletch. She was a mother who was killed jogging along the side of the road. Mm -hmm. But in that case, which wrapped up last year with a conviction, right. OK, in that case, there was DNA evidence as well. Her DNA was on some body. of this. Yes. And we also had a body. Right. But we had her DNA on this defendant's items. There wasn't a lot of it, but it was there. Why was it there? Well, gee, the mm -hmm. jury was able to connect the dots in that case. Now, mm -hmm. in the Jessica Herringa case, we don't have the DNA link, but we do have Jessica Herringa's name in this defendant's victim's right. folder. Is that enough of a link to get a conviction here? Prosecutors certainly hope so. I hope. It's I, a lot more tenuous, though. It absolutely, absolutely is because, look, we keep forgetting. We're acting as if we have a dead body. We don't have a dead body. So part of what the jury has to grapple with is, is she dead? Is Jessica Herringa dead? Jury's going to have to figure that out. Jessica Herringa's mother doesn't think so. Right. You know, she's basically got this online campaign continuing saying, hey, look, we need to find my daughter. She hasn't been seen. She hasn't been heard from. A lot of times investigators dig into a victim's bank accounts and phone and whatnot, and they say, well, you know, if indeed she were alive somewhere, she probably would have accessed the accounts or drained the accounts before disappearing or something like that. I haven't heard that kind of evidence in this case yet. No, not yet. And keep in mind, she was a mother. Mm -hmm. Very hard pressed to think that somebody would just disappear and leave their young, young child behind. Exactly. That That's another another huge issue here if the defense is even going to be so uh, obtuse, I guess I could say, to say that Jessica Hearingham might still be alive. It'd be one thing if the defense just said, okay, state, you charged off after this theory that this defendant's cousin was spinning, mm -hmm. but it turned out that you couldn't prove it, so you need to back the bus up, prosecutor, and take some of the charges away from my client. That might logically work. But I want to show the mother of Jessica Herring as a Facebook presence on the screen now. This was an anniversary post. Today marks five years since my daughter was abducted. Please share, share, and share again to any site you belong to. And she wraps it up, no Jess, no justice, in capital letters at the bottom. And just above that, the line, she is alive. Now, yeah. look, I can understand a, a mother trying to hold on to hope. Right. But look, it, it, it's a slim shot at this point that this young woman would be found alive. What do you think about this? What if the defense took a turn and did this? Admitted that Jessica is, in fact, dead, but point the finger squarely at the cousin who only pled guilty to helping hide the body. A, a complete third-party defense. Some other dude did it, we like to call it in the business. What if they did that? At least then they're admitting that she's dead, but they're not admitting that Jeffrey Willis is the killer. Well, look, 
it's possible tactic. I was wondering exactly how the defense was going to play it in this case, but it seems thus far that the legal tactic of the defense is going to be to turn around and just say, hey, look, state, you can't prove its case. You can't prove your case, rather, beyond a reasonable doubt. That yeah, seems to be the tactic thus far. Thus far. That, of course, can change based on all the additional evidence that we're going to hear from the state before it rests its case. Yeah, let's get back to the testimony here. Gerald McCarthy is a computer forensic expert. He's one of the key witnesses here because it's one of the few places where this defendant, Jeffrey Willis, can be attached to the name of the victim, Jessica Herringa, and the attachment came in the defendant's own computer. Let's listen. And here we are listening to testimony from a computer forensic expert in the trial against Jeffrey Willis. He's a Michigan man accused of killing a gas station attendant, 25-year-old Jessica Herringa. Her body has never been found. The state going through pains to try to link the defendant to the crime with no DNA and no victim's body. Jonas Spielborg, I know we have a couple of minutes left here, mm -hmm. but look, the state and the way the state is doing the questioning is really slowing things down here, getting into a lot of detail, and that's exactly the tactic that the prosecutor needs to take here. Oh, absolutely, especially when we don't have any direct evidence whatsoever. And look, we have to have 12 people in the jury box who are convinced that there is a dead body when we know that they're not hearing evidence of this, but the victim's own mother thinks she's still alive. So the jury has to get past the first hurdle is somebody dead? Do we have, was there a killing of any sorts? And then the next step is, was it murder and was it by this particular defendant? It's not going to be an easy road. It's not going to be an easy road to hoe. Well, the part that the state's really hammering home to the jury right now are these computer files with the victim's initials that were saved on an anniversary of the date of her disappearance and death. Yeah. And uh, we're going to probably see some links made there that he was memorializing the crime that he committed. I'm sure that at a minimum we're going to hear that in a, a closing argument from the state here. Oh, yes, absolutely. And I think people should be riveted to the cross-examination of this particular, uh, I'll call him an expert, the computer scientist on the stand, because how do you cross-examine him? How do you go with this particular uh, expert and try to make this any better? Because I'll tell you what, this is the most damaging evidence we've heard thus far, in my opinion. And we're going to hear more of it in just a minute. I know that we need to let you go, though, Jonas Spielborg. Reluctantly. <laughs> uh, yes, you're a pro. We always appreciate your insight. Criminal you. defense attorney from New York City. Thanks. Good to see you, as always. Okay, we're going to move on with our analysis of the Jeffrey Willis case in Michigan, a murder trial, with more testimony from Gerald McCarthy, a computer forensics expert.